Hi, and welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm gonna be teaching you how to make an app just like this one, where that you can go ahead and load up a bunch of images that you might have stored either in a database or locally or in the cloud and automatically change the grid in a Streamlit application with just a couple clicks of a button. And you're gonna learn how to do all this and a couple tricks along the way. As always, the code for that's all polished is available on GitHub. There's a link in the description down below and it looks like this. But in this video, we're gonna live code everything so that I can kind of explain the choices that are being made and why they're being made. And if you stick with me through the end of this video, you'll learn a couple tricks about Streamlit along the way. So let's go ahead and load up our new application, which we're gonna be calling Demo. So if you're not familiar with Streamlit, I have a whole series on Streamlit, but I'm going to be expecting that you have some basic understanding about it, how it works. But we're gonna be loading up the demo.py file, our application, and in the GitHub repository, home.py with a capital H is the polished code that you should test and run locally. Now we in the command line, we can say streamlet run demo.py, and we're gonna spin up our demo file right here, which right now is just blank. So nothing's gonna be populated. As always, we're gonna import streamlet as st, and we're gonna go ahead and save that and hit rerun in our browser. And we're doing this all in real time and live. So the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna import glob. Everything in this video uses Python native libraries or Streamlit. This is all we're going to need. And we're gonna see some problems with glob in this video and how to kind of address them if you're using it in your script. There are better ways, but for introduction to Python individuals, glob is an easy way to kind of load up a bunch of different files into memory. So the very first thing that we need to do is we need to give our app a title. So let's Let's go ahead and say st.title. So we're going to be using that streamlet uh, library now. And we're going to say demo image grid display. Why not? And we're going to hit rerun and we should see a title pop up. And we do. And let's zoom in just a little bit here on our application as well. So now that we've given our application a title, let's go ahead and load in our data. So what are we working with in this video? Well, in our data subfolder or images subfolder, we're gonna have three different manuscripts uh, which whose images all sit in three different subdirectories. So I need to load up all of those file names and I can do this with a function. So let's go ahead and say def is equal to load images. And this is not gonna take any arguments. We're going to expect all the images in this scenario to be in one uh, directory with a collection of subdirectories. You're gonna to have to kind of adjust this a little bit to however your data is structured locally or in the cloud. And so I'm gonna say image files is equal to glob.glob. .glob, and I'm gonna grab everything in images with a uh, wildcard for any directory, another wildcard for any file that ends in .jpg and always good to kind of test out your functions along the way. And because we're using Streamlit, we're gonna use, instead of print, we're gonna use st.write for everything. And let's just take a look at the length of our image files to make sure everything is running correctly. And we should see, oh, it helps if you actually call the function. If we go, uh, and we're gonna call these image files is equal to load images. Let's call this images instead of image. There we are. And we see we have 629 files, fantastic. Uh, now, what I'm gonna be returning is eventually a list of, of files and a list of manuscripts. But in order to actually return the image files and the manuscripts, I need to actually find a way to extract those manuscripts. So if I were to iterate over each of these, uh, these files, I'll notice that each of them has a subdirectory where the subdirectory is the actual manuscript name. So I can say for image file and image files, I can st.write image file. And I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of manuscripts right here because that will return an error. And I have all these image files all printed off. Now, because I'm using glob, um, glob is gonna work a little differently if you're on Linux, Mac, or Windows. So you can always just go image file equals image file dot replace. And we're gonna replace the double back, or the backslash that we see right here with a forward slash. So this becomes uh, operating system agnostic, meaning it will run on any operating system. If you're doing this in production, always better to use something like path. But again, we're doing this right now just to kind of have a better understanding of what's happening for all audiences. And if I rerun this, we see that my image file has now been adjusted. So 
what I need to do is I need to grab a list of all these manuscript names, which appear right here. Now this is in the, the second position if I were to split this up by the forward slash. So let's go ahead and do that right now. We're gonna say parts is equal to image file dot split, and we're gonna split at the, at the forward slash. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna print off parts one, and we should get a list of all of our manuscripts. So now what I can do is outside of this loop, is I can store a list of uh, called manuscripts, and I can say if parts one not in manuscripts, then manuscripts.append parts one. And now instead of doing st.write parts one, let's do this and put this outside of the loop. Manuscripts, there we are. We should have a list of manuscripts. Now I always like to, just in case, always sort these out. So we can use manuscripts.sort to sort out the list alphabetically. I think these are already sorted alphabetically, they are, but now we've got our manuscripts. So we can go ahead and return this manuscripts list as well. And we're gonna see now why that was important. I want the user in this application to be able to select multiple or individual manuscripts. And in Streamlit, we can do that with the multi-select feature. So I'm gonna call this view images, the images that the user will want to actually view. And this will be a st.multiselect. And we're gonna say select manuscripts and for that and it's gonna be a list of different manuscripts that they can select. And if we hit run, we see now that we've got this list loaded in. So you can select any one of these manuscripts. So now just to make sure everything is working correctly, I can go ahead and eliminate this from our application. We don't need that anymore. That was just to kind of debug and test. I can go ahead and do st.write view images. And again, it's always best to kind of do this so you can see how your app is working as you're designing it, so that you can kind of debug as you go along. This is kind of good practice. Instead of writing a whole block of code and just hoping for it to work, always do something like st.write. So now that we know that our application actually does work correctly, we can eliminate that. Uh, let's go ahead now and give the user the ability to select how wide they want a grid to be. And in this case, we're gonna call this N. This is gonna stand for the width of our actual grid. And so N is gonna be equal to st.number input. And we wanna give the user the ability uh, to select grid width for the name. And we wanna give the user the ability to select anything from maybe one up to five. That's really gonna be um, what I would consider to be the max here. We're working with thumbnails, but you can go up to 10. It's gonna get pretty clunky pretty quickly. And let's set the default to three. So this is gonna be the minimum value. This will be the maximum value. And then this will be the default value. So the thing that the user always gets when they load up the app, and you can see that we have a grid set of three. So now comes the fun part. And if you're looking at the actual code here in the repository, this is gonna be this section right here. This bit of code is going to allow us to actually go ahead and iterate over all of our view images uh, and actually grab out things that are separated by the nth number. So if we wanna grab everything from, uh, to create a list of subsets for maybe every three items. But before we get to that, we have to be able to actually go through and grab out the images that we want our user to actually view. So in this scenario, we know all of the image files and we know the manuscripts that they actually want to see. And let's go ahead and change this uh, to uh, view manuscripts instead, something like that. So we can say for, um, for image file and image files, we're gonna iterate over this and we're gonna call view images out right here. And this is gonna be an empty list that we can append to. We're going to say if any manuscript, so we're gonna use any here, any is a way that we can in Python look to see if any item in a list appears in another list or appears in a string in our case. So if any manuscript is in the image file, so in that string, that image file name, for manuscript in view manuscripts. Then, and again, for right now, let's do st.write, then print off image file. So now when we run this, we shouldn't see anything, and instead we can just say, 
select this and we see that everything that comes out is one of these scenarios where it's SC, um, CSG. If we close this off, we should get CEA and again we do. And because this is multi-select, we can select multiple things and we'll see that this will go down a lot. This is printing off a lot and we just have these two manuscripts. So we know that this, this, um, this bit of code is actually working correctly. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say view images dot append and we're gonna append that particular image file. That means that we should have a list of just manuscripts that we want our user to be able to work with. Right now we have an empty list. If we load this up, we see we have just these files loaded. If we close that, we can load up just this one and we see that we just have these files actually loaded. So now the user has the ability to select specific images. So instead of writing these off, what we can do is we can go ahead and we can iterate over our, uh, our view images by an nth degree so we can create subsets, sublists. And this is gonna function as our grid when we try to give the user the ability to display images out. We're essentially trying to create a grid of n numbers wide. So what we can say is for, uh, actually we're gonna create an empty list called groups. And then what I'm gonna do, so that this is a little easier to, to view, I'm gonna create just a little um, block out code right down there so that we can actually view everything a bit more easily. So we're gonna say for image, or for uh, i and range, we're gonna start at zero, and for the length of all view images, and we're gonna iterate up across this list every n number. And what this is going to allow us to do is to, let's just go ahead and see, and we're again, we're gonna use st.write. It's gonna allow us to actually iterate in a list over everything. So if we were to select this, we see it goes from zero to three to six. So it's ticking up every three items. If we switch this to four, it's ticking up every four items. This is gonna be the basis, the logic behind our ability to create a grid and streamlet. So we don't wanna just write this off. We want to create a new group of images. So we can say groups.append view images, and we can index it at I, so start indexing, it at the i interval, and then we're going to say, go from there to i plus n. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna grab everything into n number subsets from our original list. And if we run st.write groups, we can actually see this at work. So we'll see right now it's every nth, so we have a collection of three here. If we change this to four, we have a collection of four, and now we've got our data separated out, our image files all separated out into individual groups. But we don't want to write these off. Instead, what we want to do is we want to iterate over these groups now and be able to actually put these into columns and streamlet. So we have a couple different options here. Now, out of the box, you're probably thinking to yourself, I will create my columns outside of this loop. So I can say st.columns to create columns. And if any of this is a little confusing to you, I have a whole series of tutorials on Streamlit that cover all these different features. But let's go ahead and create a collection of columns. Now, in this case, we're gonna have n number of columns, which is gonna to correspond to this number that a user passes in here and this number input. And so we could say something like uh, calls n, so going to that nth number, or sorry, I, and we need to iterate over this. So enumerate's gonna allow us to create an I uh, variable each time we iterate up through this list. So we know um, specifically which I we're actually at. And oops, I have made one mistake here. We are gonna do that just fine. There we are. And we're gonna say uh, for image in group, this way we can actually grab the individual image file. Actually, let me do image file in group, then we're gonna say calls i, and this is where we're going to actually enumerate dot image, and we're gonna load in that image file. And if we do this and we run this, we're going to see that it, it seemingly on the surface works pretty well. Now I wanna draw a couple attentions here. First, how is this working? Well, let's go ahead and do st.write i, and then we're gonna do image file. 
So if you're not familiar with how enumerate works, it allows for us to tick up each time and grab something at that specific index. So uh, we actually have a variable i being created automatically. This is equivalent to doing i equals i plus one in a for loop. And since we know what index we're at, we know which column to actually write to. So that's how this is actually working under the hood. And if we do this, we actually give the user now the ability to go through and populate a grid. Now on the surface, this does seem like we're done, but let me draw your attention to where this might be problematic, just from a aesthetics point of view. If we scroll down, we'll notice that we've got things aligned somewhat, but it starts to get a little clunky when our images aren't of the same size. And this is gonna be a problem across the board whenever you're working with Streamlit and displaying images in a grid fashion. So how do we get around this? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make our columns populated inside the loop. So each time we go through, a new set of columns is going to be made. Now, let's see what this difference actually does. Everything is now structured in a consistent way where no matter what our image sizes are, no matter how long our captions might be for these images, they are always going to align each row. Now, why does this work? Well, it works because at the HTML level, our columns are being populated within this loop and being erased iteratively as we go through and create uh, these different columns. They're being essentially erased in memory and a new collection of columns is being made. Now, what that means is that in the HTML container, a new container is being made each time, as opposed to one overarching container that kind of populates each row dynamically based on the preceding row's image size. So what you have though, is essentially from just 32 lines of code, which again, could be a lot tighter if you weren't doing uh, things like this. And if you were using um, uh, a list comprehension in a couple places, you could make this a lot tighter. But what you have here is an effective way to create an image grid and streamlet from a database of images or a bunch of images stored locally. That's gonna be all for this video. Thank you so much for listening. If you've gotten a lot out of it, please do consider supporting this channel via Patreon or via YouTube members down below. As always, everything I get from YouTube members or Patreons goes back into the channel. If you do get a lot out of it, please do consider supporting that way. And as always, thank you to everyone who already does support it. You help keep this content free for everyone going forward.